Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of NBS. This episode is uh, going to be touching on the recently concluded court case, uh, briefly, with the North Pacific vs. Magic, as well as what we are referring to as Midterm Madness. That would, of course, be the recent mass resignations from members of the cabinet, and the general discussion into the delegates' activity levels. So we'll be touching on that. Uh, I have a slew of guests at this time, my first one being, of course, Bob. Hello, that's me. Ghost. Hi. Chipoli. Hello. And Ruben. Hi. So this is a bit of a more impromptu uh, episode. Thank you for our live audience members for joining us on such short notice. But, you know, uh, a lot has happened, especially within the last 48 hours. And hopefully, you know, we're going we're gonna to have some time here to talk about it as well as... Uh, just to explain a bit about the time out of events here, and I think I think members of the cabinet, namely Ghost and Chipoli, who we have on here, are really going to be useful for uh, providing us that timeline, so as to um, kind of contextualize what this is all about and why it is happening. Uh, first thing we're going to go over, just the facts: the ministers of foreign affairs, world assembly affairs, communications, and an advisor to the delegate, the sole advisor to the delegate have all resigned in a uh, mass statement, attaching their names and confirming their resignations. So, in the time since then, we have seen a Minister of WA Affairs replacement in Mage Castle. Uh, and Chipoli, as the ex-Minister of World Assembly Affairs, can you tell us a bit about uh, you know Mage Castle working under you? I know that you've said in the past that you've recommended him for the role. Tell us a bit how you think that's going to go with him as being the replacement minister. Thank you very much. And now, I believe Mage Castle was quite a very um, obvious pick. I think it was quite simple for Grundle to straight up appoint him. It was the quickest appointment and the first one to the pl replace one of the reside uh, cabinet ministers. And Mage Castle or Mage Castle has done great work in the WA ministry. Um, he's been a huge part of releasing our WA engagement program. He created the whole script for that. And more recently, he also replaced the outdated WA 101 programs, which um, are intended to help uh, new staffers for the WA uh, ministry um, learn how to write a, a proposal. And it was, it was part of the greater staff training program. That was part of my vision. Uh, when, when I first got the job back in May. And uh, he was my executive deputy um, for the, the term, which meant he was the number two second in command and was essentially, essentially the guy to go to when I was not there or when I was in my acting delegacy period. But I think Gruntel made a very good decision and he's going to do great. And I have full faith in him to succeed in this new role. Yeah, I would say that that was obviously uh, probably the easiest pick for Grundu as far as if he really is serious about uh, filling these roles and getting the cabinet back to being fully staffed. Mage Castle and WA Affair is obviously the former executive deputy. I've worked with him personally on um, a role play CNC uh, proposal that we passed. So yeah, you know, I, I generally think that there was a consensus that even... Had this not happened, he was going to be next up in terms of who the minister was about to be. I will note, however, that it's interesting, due to the constitutional law, the Ministry of WA Affairs is actually not one of the mandatory ministries. The delegate still does need to appoint a minister of foreign affairs. That is a constitutionally mandated office that must be filled. Um, and, and thus far it's not, obviously. This is a very recent development. So it's not necessarily fair of us to say, oh, everything has to be filled all, all of a sudden. But uh, just just to provide a bit of background as to why this happened, uh, if you would, Ghost, I'd like to kind of invite you to say a few words, considering you were the poster of that statement, and of course you were in the cabinet all throughout the term thus far to kind of see those developments happen. Okay, so let's just use this as an example. If you just asked me all of those questions, and I just sat here and didn't say anything at all, and awkward silence entailed, and you were like, so, um, did you hear my question? Hello, are you there? 
that's kind of the experience that uh, most of the ministers have had for a few weeks now since the delegate's been on his trip. So you let some time pass, you give him a chance to respond, nothing happens. Maybe he comes back with one really quick post, and it's kind of like, okay, but how about this, this, and that? And you try reaching out a few different places, you try a few different people try talking to him, and it's just it's it's this frustrating mm-hmm. game of I don't even call it a game of telephone because that kind of implies there's someone else on the other end who is listening to you, and it just doesn't feel like that's happening. So it's just this frustration of a breakdown of communications that's been going on. I'd say literally since he said he came back from his absence, but uh, it was also kind of before that too. But it just. I don't. I don't really know. I, I mean, we we try to put in the best terms possible, but if I had to simplify it to down to one thing, it's that you feel like you're out alone by yourself, um, and nobody's there to pull in the line if you need help. There isn't anybody kind of looking looking out over your shoulder, uh, and he's the guy who's supposed to be overseeing the entire thing. So it feels kind of weird that you're you're putting all of your efforts and all of your questions and concerns out into the delegate's desk and I just pictures just piling up and uh, yeah a lack of confidence as a result of that really is what it, what it boils down to nobody wants to try their best try to do a bunch of stuff and actually get stuff done and and like like this show for example and is one in a, in a long line this term because comms has been doing really well and you would not never think that Cash has to resign because he's doing a fantastic job, but you know, <laughs> there there is something to be said about all of that effort going somewhere, feeling like we're we're getting the ultimate plan done, the delegates platform, and when the delegates not really around, it's just kind of like, where's all of this going? Where's all this leading to? It just it feels like a bunch of loose threads that aren't being tied together properly. And the delegate's normally the one who ties it together, I guess. That's how I would, how I'd put it. So uh, we felt that we, unfortunately, had to send a message and, and also couldn't sign on to the government as it, as it was at this point in time. And uh, nobody wanted to stop doing the work they wanted to do, but it just kind of felt like we didn't have much of a choice. Yeah, I definitely think that that sentiment was um, expressed widely across the ministers. I'm, I know that each of them released a separate statement in which they, you know, in addition to the thread, uh, in response to the thread, they kind of confirmed that, yes, they affirmed that they were signing off on uh, their, their joint resignation along with yours, but they also offered their own statements uh, sort of in closing to their jobs and their positions in their own subforums. And that, that was one of the... Um, widely expressed sentiments that hey it's not it's not that we don't want to do these jobs like we don't it's not an issue of us wanting to do this wanting to stay not wanting to leave like we would rather of course stay in the positions that we are but unfortunately due to the way that the executive is functioning that that has become increasingly difficult for us over the last weeks and months i think that's the general sentiment i got um chipoli would you say that i have that right absolutely just Ghost was there in the cabinet with me, and he just explained it superbly. Not only were the citizens left in the dark, the, ca- the cabinet was left in the dark as well. We often went days without hearing from our delegate. In my capacity as the vice delegate, and in Ghost's capacity as the advisor to the delegate, we tried to reach out to him. You know, I tried to get some things going. I think we just had a, a, a lack of support, especially for are two new cabinet ministers. They are coming into the job for the first time, but unfortunately, they're not quite get a, the quite um, authentic experience that they should be getting. Unfortunately, we can just cannot function under a part-time delegate. I love doing my job. I had, a, I had a great time doing it, but I just became frustrated with the indecisiveness and lack of communication from the man who was supposed to be our allegiance reader, um, excuse me, leader, and um, he didn't step up when he was needed. Um, he left the ministers to sort of fend for themselves, and he was clearly content doing so. He didn't. He didn't uh, seem to make a real attempt to connect to us until it was too little, too late, and Ghost had his rec- resignation ready to go, ready to post. 
and it was just he didn't realize it was a problem until it was too late in the term and he, I think he sort of realized there was not much he could do to stop us from resigning at that point. Yeah, and I think you bring up an interesting point about just the newer ministers, those who haven't been on the cabinet before, getting that authentic experience. I even remarked it in the uh, Citizens Channel that, you know, they're, I think I think the, the verbiage I used was that they're crushing it, and they really are as far as just their enthusiasm and willingness to learn and want to do the job. They're absolutely passing that mark with flying colors, the new ministers that were appointed in both home affairs and culture. But at the same time, uh, I do think it's a bit bittersweet that they have to serve under these types of circumstances where this is not how a normal uh, cabinet or administration functions. And for them to be brought up into the executive, I think that's good that we're pushing new talent and that they're you know, being able to showcase what they have to offer to those areas. But at the same time, um, I, I do hope that this experience hasn't left a sour taste in their mouth as far as, you know, the general impression of this is not how a cabinet is usually led. Ruben, I know that you've been a staffer in a, a number of ministries, and as well as a deputy in some others. As, as for the new ministers, Culture and H.A., Lions, uh, Meow, and Nutmeg, uh, what have you seen from them? What do you like? And uh, do you have anything that you specifically want to say, considering that they were left out of the mass resignations? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have... As a relative newcomer to this region, I obviously don't know that much about how it generally goes in this region or how the general activity is with the delegate. Um, but um, as I obviously joined a little bit uh, before Holden's uh, resignation, um, so I've only witnessed uh, Gorundu's uh, delegacy and. It's obviously very disappointing um, that he's been so inactive. And um, I do think this has left uh, Lions Roar and Nutmeg in a very difficult position um, as newcomers to the cabinet and uh, newcomers to the executive. Um, it's obviously a very difficult challenge, but I think they've done an extraordinary job despite these difficult circumstances at managing their ministries and as i've been a little bit more involved in uh, the home affairs uh, upper management as deputy minister um in recent times at least um with various new programs getting launched um i have seen uh, lions road taking extraordinary effort um to make the ministry more active and uh, try to support it to the best of his abilities, and I definitely commend him for that. And Nutmeg has obviously also tried his best um, to um, do as much uh, culture uh, as you uh, can. Culture is, I think, in nation states in general, um, quite often a weaker ministry, but I think uh, despite of the situation and despite of the general theme that um, the Ministry of Culture generally has. I think despite that, uh, Nutmeg has done a great job at um, reviving it and trying to do the best he can despite of the situation at hand. Yeah, undoubtedly, they've they've done well to take up the mantle uh, in in lieu of those you know other staffing requirements. Comfed obviously moving over to defense in a Lions Meow's case, and of course they're not being a minister of culture for quite a while prior to Nutmeg. Uh, there was a bit of a, shall we say, prolonged absence of a minister, and you know these mass resignations have not sort of eased that pressure because even though the cabinet was staffed for a while. As we're recording this, we do not have a minister of communications. We don't. Yeah, we also don't have a minister of foreign affairs. Yeah, yeah. As we, mentioned previously. Right. Um. And so, yeah. Obviously, it's it's a very it's gonna you know take effort from the delegate in order to find these replacements. But just the general sense of you know the running theme of disappointment that I have is I think it's really illustrated, kind of by what you said that they're doing the best with what they have. But like Ghost and Chipotle pointed out, they don't have a lot to go off of. And especially when you're newer to the executive, I feel like you do need that. 
Uh, when I was brought along as Minister of HA, um, when I first joined TNP, of course, I had to learn that. And in any role that you haven't been in, or even if you hadn't been in the region for a long time, like Ruben is saying, where you're not familiar with how things have worked in past terms, you do need a bit of guidance. You do maybe need a bit of mentorship. And if you don't have a delegate who, at the very least, is willing to answer your questions, engage with you, talk to you, that that is going to be a bit of an issue. And that's kind of going to hamper uh, your performance. So while they're doing well with what they're given, I just wonder how much better could this have all been if the ministers were given more because it's not that they're underperforming no 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 they are doing uh what they can with what they've got but if they had more i i just think that this would be taken to such a higher level than what we've been seeing um and bob i mean you've seen that because you're across all the ministries as well just the efforts of the ministers but i think one thing that you and i were talking about prior to this broadcast is that these efforts are largely made uh, in spite of the delegate and not because of him if you right. Any... The, yeah. the delegate is often considered sort of the engine that makes things go or a catalyst or a leader or and it's just it's I, I, I think it would be safe to say almost as far as the um, as how we could describe the leadership style of this delegate there just seems to be not the um, from the amount that I've talked to different cabinet ministers, both those of, who have resigned and who have not, um, the delegate just hasn't been around to provide that leadership, to provide that feedback, to provide anything. And I think that's what's really kind of concerning here is we have an excellent cabinet and I don't want... I the the worst possible outcome of something like this is burning one or more of these individuals out because we've got, we have, or had, I suppose, a great cabinet, and I don't want to burn them out. That'd be a terrible way to walk out of all this is even more short-staffed, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Like I was saying, the sour taste that could possibly be left in their mouth, and I will notice, uh, I will note that even amongst one of the ministers who chose not to join onto the mass resignations in nutmeg for culture uh i think that they're in particular maybe one of the remaining ministers who's been more vocal um and and what we've heard from them uh, if they don't mind me saying so is just generally not extremely positive or encouraging obviously they're new to the job we some of us as you know citizens have checked in with them like hey how is this going uh, both in public and I'm sure in private, and you know, especially since this uh, state, these kind of statements came out, um, I generally get the sense that Nutmeg could have easily been included in that had things gone a bit differently, just based off of what they're saying. So, I even even amongst the remaining cabinet members, I'm not sure that you have this strong semblance of confidence in the delegates' leadership. So I think when people are saying, oh, the delegate has lost the cabinet's confidence or lost the support of the cabinet, I think that's an entirely fair statement, given what we've seen, not only from those who have resigned, but also those who haven't. Uh, and one thing I will kind of transfer this to is the period of the absence that we had with uh, acting delegate Chipoli as opposed to vice delegate Chipoli. Did any of you guys particularly have any points of, like, clear, like, night and day that you saw from Chipoli compared to Grundy? Because I think it was fairly apparent, personally, but I just wanted to see where everyone's at as far as the general sense around the region on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we immediately saw a surge of activity from the acting delegate and uh, with various appointments and um other things that i don't quite remember but i just have a bad memory but um with weeks uh, of silence from the delegate it was definitely like a major difference seeing Chip chipoli um actually doing something which is absolutely fantastic but it's strange that the acting delegate is more active <laughs> than the uh um, delegate that's supposed to do the job so it's it's great that um activity surged uh for a short while but it's also saddening to see that 
the uh, activity immediately dropped down again when uh, the delegate uh, took over uh, again um, and declaring the uh, absence uh, over um, and uh, in turn uh, staying silent and not being active even though they um, revoked their uh, declaration of absence which I thought was very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a safe observation to make, I think. Uh, Chipotle definitely wanted to uh, pick up some slack, and I know there was a lot of uh, concern at the time that because of how things had been going, and with uh, Grundu being on that trip, that things could not stop. Things had to keep going, and uh, I, I will always give him credit. He He was very on the ball with following up with all the ministers and trying to make sure all the projects were still moving forward. And it is a little unfortunate that we didn't get a little bit more of that. I think the absence was something, it's still a relatively new thing that delegates have in their toolbox to use. And knowing when to use it and when to deploy it really, is really important, especially uh, in Gurundu's case with this really long trip. Uh, one week absence, which was the original absence plan, probably wasn't even enough. Uh, in retrospect, he probably should have declared the absence for the entire length of his trip. Um, and he, you know, best best reading of things, he underestimated how much more busy he was going to be when he ended that absence. Um, but... There's also something to be said about what happened when Chipotle started getting stuff done, because I I think personally looking back at it, the biggest turning point was definitely when the cards ministry decision was announced. So there were a lot of people that felt that the acting delegate making that decision instead of the actual delegate was kind of a strange choice, and I I worry that the public response to things played a role in how the absence ultimately played out because uh, Gurundu was very cautious after that and I think that kind of made it more difficult for Chipotle to do anything else of note which uh, I think to be clear he absolutely could have done he was in the process of doing it it's just I worry Gurundu may have made that choice with the wrong things in mind, shall we say. It, it, it was less about, is he able to do it? Is he really back? And more of a, can I get out of this uncomfortable situation? I think that there's been this adversarial relationship for a while between a lot of people in this region and Gurundu, and I think that's kind of the narrative in the background of all of this stuff that's, that's playing its own role. But uh, to be clear, yes, there was a difference. Chipotle versus Gurundu in those four days. And uh, I think Chipotle had the enthusiasm. He could have kept kept the momentum going if he had more time. But that obviously puts the delegate in, in, a, in a tough spot, having someone else doing all the stuff and potentially for weeks. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't good. But, you know, going on a, a trip that lasts almost a month in, in the middle of your delegacy is going to create some awkward situations. There's really no getting around that. But uh, I do I do applaud Chipotle for his work during those four days. Uh, I think he did a, a great job, more than a lot of acting delegates are asked to do, except maybe Grundu when he took over for Boston after the resignation <laughs> earlier in the year. So ironic how that uh, works out. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, he didn't have to deal with as much nonsense as Grundu did, and I will always give Grundu credit for that period. But. Yeah, a lot, a lot has changed in a few months, unfortunately. But I'd say good, good work to Chipotle. Great, great energy. Uh, I know I, I got feedback from the other ministers. They were very, they were very excited about how things were going. They, they liked it. They, they noticed it too. So, yeah, good job. Yeah, just this idea that a lot has changed in a few months. I think that it's completely fair to say that. Not not just in terms of expectations, but also just in terms of uh, widespread positive sentiment. When uh, Grundu first took over for Hold'em after the resignation and sort of guided the region through that period with the TSP relationship and, of course, the subsequent Aurora alliance repeal, 
Uh, I think people generally thought that the delegate was being uh, handling the situation well and was being pretty responsive to the citizenry as far as people were quite upset with TSP and, uh, you know, depending on how you view the situation, rightfully so. But at the end of the day, the RA overwhelmingly did confirm to end that relationship and the delegate uh, was part of moving that process along so that the citizens could give their input. So I think that from very on, from very early on, people thought that this was going to be a very responsive delegate. And, and like Ghost said, unfortunately, that has not been the case as uh, the months have gone on. But it's just such a drastic change. I will say, uh, from my perspective, as far as the absence period goes, uh, I think it was very short-lived. As far as, you know, Ghost mentioning those four days, but I think that during those four days, obviously, it was a very stark contrast uh, between the two, just in terms of leadership styles, but also just in terms of enthusiasm um, for, you know, moving things along and keeping the momentum up. And for me, it's that enthusiasm, that spirit, that effort that really sticks out to me about Chipotle's leadership uh, during that time, how I, I know that he was checking in with the ministers and seeing where they were at. And I can I can absolutely understand why the ministers would have been excited about that, because if they weren't getting the support that they needed, as we've come to find out, well, under Chipotle, they might have, uh, you know, been been able to get that. Whereas under Grandu, once the return happened, uh, that did not end up becoming the case, despite uh, the end of the absence. So I think that the end of the absence, like Ghost was mentioning about perhaps the delegate was focused on the wrong things, I think it was a bit premature to end that absence. Um, undeniably, it's uncomfortable. Ghost and I have both sat in that seat before. It can get uncomfortable at times. Um, and, you know, that's not that's not something to downplay. It can be uncomfortable, but part of being a leader in both the region and the community is being able to um, navigate those situations. And I think we've seen either a failure or inability on the part of the delegate to navigate those difficult, uncomfortable situations, save for the TSP drama. Um, foreign affairs. That's the next thing I do want to talk about. Uh, we mentioned previously we don't have a Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but prior to this, I've seen from new Minister Mage Castle that there's actually reference of some of Fregerson's work and what he was doing during the time that he was... Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, I know that Mage Castle is not here with us on this broadcast, but Chipotle, if you would, could you tell us a bit about that and how the Ministry of WA Affairs is using uh, what a bit of Fregerson's work to continue work of their own? Yes, I will. And some of our projects that we have done were not com all of my ideas. I have to give some credit to my predecessor, which was Fregerson. Uh, the game side navigation program was actually more or less his idea. I was really the one to advance it and to get it to the final stages where it was able to be unleashed into the wild. In the Beach Castle was, I mentioned this earlier, um, developed that script for that project and he was very helpful and he also uh, created a few guides which were also talked about during Fregerson's term and he posted about eight or seven or six, I'm not quite sure what the number is, uh, WA 101 guides. And, well, Mage Castle, I know him as a hard worker. I know him as he can be trusted. He's very consistent and he'll be a good minister. He's just a valuable asset to the WA ministry. And he has been for the last few months, ever since he uh, first came to the North Pacific. And I'm very excited for the future of the WA ministry. After my resignation, I'll of course try to, I will not have been in the ministry. I cannot, like, I could not serve as a minister anymore uh, due to my lack of confidence in the current handling of the leadership. But I, that by no means I will abandon the ministry and I'll still look to advance its agenda and its project to make sure things are not getting done. But I think Medge Castle will can be very trusted to get all those things done, and I think he'll lead the ministry and will do great things with it in the future. So I have no concerns about the future of the ministry under him. Yeah, I uh, did verify it here. There are seven freshly written guides by Mage Castle, of course, revamping some of the older guides that were written by Mouse Bumples and other members of uh, the World Assembly Legislative League. That's kind of a revamp project 
that, you know, you said Frigg gave the inspiration for, of course, Ferguson having a history in WA Affairs. But uh, it's good to see that both uh, his successor, you, and as well as your successor now, Mage Castle, have been sort of carrying that along. So we, we, we have seen examples where even despite this looming cloud of, you know, disappointment or just general uh, feelings that the delegate's not up to the task anymore amongst some members of the region, we have seen things uh, be moved along, and this is one such example of a project that has been able to move along across multiple different terms uh, in light of the Hold'em resignation, in light of this mass resignation um, incident. So it is encouraging to see that this has not put a damper on absolutely everything. And, you know, you mentioned Mage Castle being a hard worker. I mentioned how um, he and I have worked together previously in the WA, and I would absolutely vouch for him on that. That uh, he, He's very detail-oriented, very active. Uh, it's an easy replacement, as far as the delegate is concerned, to get him in that role in light of these resignations. But I do have to ask, I do have to put feelers out here, and I will call on Bob for this, if uh, maybe maybe the initial knee-jerk response from the delegate is a bit... Uh, a bit underwhelming, in a way. In in my view, it wasn't a, okay, let's acknowledge these mass resignations for what they are and maybe outline plans going forward. He immediately jumped to, and I'm not necessarily saying that this was wrong, because you do want to get those uh, spots filled, but he did immediately jump to, okay, who can I replace all my ministers with? What can we do? We saw the easiest choice being Mage Castle, and he mentioned how appointments uh, will come in the coming days, Grundu did. But I, I do have to wonder where the priorities are here as far as communicating that plan for the region. What's going to happen from here on out? Because that is a question that's on everyone's minds. So uh, I, di I did want to put that out to the, there to see what you guys think of it. And if you think that immediately moving to a point and replace ministers was the, you know, appropriate response given this incident. I mean, I'm the delegate. And on behalf of everyone in the region, thank God I'm not the delegate, but I am kind of off-put. I don't know if that's the right word, um, but I'm going to use that, off-put, by the delegate's response, because I, I sort of expected not quite damage control, but I expected some sort of damage control. I expected some sort of, I don't know, acknowledgement of... Okay, my entire cabinet just resigned. There, there's obviously some grievance they have with me. What the hell is going on? I didn't really get a sense of that. I just got a sense of, all right, business as usual. Let's bury our head in the sand and hope this goes away. Like, I hope I'm wrong. And that's not the mindset that the delegate was approaching this with. I hope I'm wrong. But I can't say with confidence that I am that far from the truth because I don't see a sense of urgency from the delegate about getting these ministers replaced. There's deputies everywhere doing fantastic jobs like, hell, you've recorded every single NBS show this term. Give me a give me a reason why you're not minister of communications just as because, fat oh, and I can and just give you as, that reason. I can give oh, you I that. know that reason. No, no, no. I because I, I was asked about this uh, in in the comms channel, and there's a very simple answer to that. I can understand that when you're wanting to replace ministers, if you go to people and they're very uh, apprehensive of the idea of joining this mm -hmm. government, given the reputation that it's got. And the simple answer to that is, even if I was asked to, which I don't believe that I would, I it's just like Chipotle mentioned earlier. I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to record NBS. I absolutely love doing this. We're going to lead the revival. We're going to continue to lead the revival. But do I want to join this government? Am I comfortable with the idea of attaching my name to this? Absolutely not. I, I, I would reject that offer. And I can understand why you know people who Grundu might have reached out to would be doing the same for reasons other than time commitments and stuff like that, just the general reputation that this government has got, I can understand why people wouldn't be, you know, super enthusiastic to sign their names on the dotted line for that, you know? 
Well, um, also, I want to remind you that uh, even in good times, when there's nothing wrong with the government and there's no controversy, and we reach out to people to serve as ministers, they often decline just because they don't feel that the time is right or that they are a good fit for the job. And we've had to, the, the list of names of people that we've asked to serve in roles, and you can ask any former delegate this question. Um, if Sawali's in our audience, for example, I know for a fact there are people Sawali reached out to in the past that, that turned him down. And that's just, that's kind of par for the course. So there's all sorts of reasons why they might say no. There's all sorts of reasons why Gurundu might be having difficulty filling the positions, uh, especially foreign affairs. That is notoriously difficult to fill. And um, yeah, that's without FA, any there's a reason I didn't mention it in that spiel. It's harder to fill than communications. There's, though I, though I will say there's a... Um, a great deputy minister of foreign affairs who's uh who's using his his gifts in communication at this moment maybe on this voice call might not be i don't know but there are deputy ministers in all these ministries and it would not shock me if they all got something in their dms from the delegate in the upcoming days okay bob let's just say for example since you're a deputy in nfa uh, do you think the delegate would be inclined to put you in his cabinet when you are obviously one of the most outspoken critics of his administration even before all of this happened? I wouldn't consider myself one of the most outspoken critics of this delegacy. I think I've... <clears throat> I, I'd like to think, at least, that I've been at least impartial if... If his perception matches yours in so far as, oh, this guy's been tearing me to shreds, then no, I would not want a guy tearing me to shreds in my cabinet. That, that much is true. And that is, of course, part of why I mentioned I don't believe that I would get that offer in my inbox. Uh, I, I fully am aware of um, how I can be potentially outspoken at times, and I think that Gruntu would be well within uh, reason to, uh, you know distrust me a bit if I were to come into his cabinet. I think that's fair. And that's not a knock on him or a knock on me. I just think it's the reality of the situation. He's got to choose people who he thinks, you know, would would at least buy into what he's selling as long as he wants to continue and as long as that's the general trajectory that this term, that he sees for the remainder of this term. He's obviously got to get people who he thinks are going to be, you know, willing and enthusiastic members of his team, so I can understand why you wouldn't want to appoint people who have maybe been outspoken and criticizing you in public and stuff like that. But um, given this incident and just past uh, past differences, uh, I think Ghost mentioned just the adversarial nature of some of these relationships in the region. I think that that, that short list of possible people who you know, maybe haven't criticized, I think it's getting, you know, shorter and shorter by the day. And I think that is one of the difficulties that the delegate is going to face. As far as my initial question regarding the immediate response to start appointing people. Oh, yeah, I, I still I still have an answer to that question. Oh, so. go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So if your intention is to continue to serve and to move forward, then you're going to seek out replacements for the ministers and you're and to some degree, you're going to have to act like we're not stopping, we're not being held up by this, we're going to keep going. So far, that, is, that seems to be the signal that he's sending. But also, as far as timing goes, uh, he's still on his trip. And it seems that the delegate's decision is to lay it out very honestly. I'm not going to be back for another three or four days. So if you really want to see me prove what I can do and, and get stuff done, you're going to have to wait till that point. And I don't think you're going to see any dramatic change in his activity because, as he's already said, he really can't do it. So uh, the, he's in this position where he has to do more and he has to respond to recent events, but he is incapable of doing so. Like Literally, he just cannot do it. So he has to basically hope that people are willing to wait a few more days so that he can start to demonstrate that there's some kind of change and response to this. And I know there's been some people out there that have expressed impatience with, not uh, some people, impatience with his response, but also impatience with everyone else responding to 
these events because there does seem to be a clear minority of people so far that are prepared to call it a day and be done with him. And then there's other people that are like, well, I don't like this and it's a problem and I'm probably going to join you guys, but I want to see a little bit more. I want more information. And the history of, of recalls in this region show that there's a lot more people that kind of emphasize that caution and uh, they want to be very deliberate. So um, I'd say if I were still advising the delegate, uh, if his plan was to try to keep his office, then some version of what is happening right now is what would be going on. So I would not say he is inclined to resign or to to fall to that pressure at this time, just based on what I'm seeing him do. Um, yeah, Mage Castle is kind of a gimme as a as an appointment because he was literally the second in line in that ministry. That was the obvious choice. Uh, comms doesn't have anyone like that to my knowledge. Any of the deputies could probably get elevated and comms would be fine. So he must be negotiating that or deciding, talking to a few people that he wants. Or he could be thinking of a totally new direction for comms, which would be kind of strange, I think, but it's possible. Uh, foreign affairs, if I had to wager, um, he really has no idea who to pick. He's probably reaching out to people that would never be considered normally because it would be a long shot. Uh, and again, from experience, staffing the FA ministry, very difficult. Uh, not going to, you know, not trying to sound conceited here, but uh, someone like me who's had multiple terms usually, uh, desk, it's easier desk. to pick someone. It's easier to pick someone newer to do FA than an old experienced hand because you don't really need two experienced people in the position necessarily. And uh, that was sort of the model that Gurundu had followed when he appointed Friedgerson. So I'm thinking that he still can try that, but based on the situation that's currently going on, I think he would probably lean towards someone with more experience. And those people are usually retired or, or just tired and don't really want to join in on a government in a good day. On a bad day like this, uh, good luck. Good luck convincing them. But that's probably what he's trying to do right now, and that I, I would wager that's where the delay's coming from. And you mentioned uh, some people wanting to see a bit more in the coming days before uh, kind of wrapping up their mind, and I think that's a great segue into Fiji's question here. Of course, Fiji, a live audience member right now, as well as a former delegate, in which he asks, why now? Gurundu returns from his trip in two days. Ghost mentioned that. If the cabinet has waited for a month for the trip to be over, why not just wait two or more days, or more fairly, a week for business to return as usual? This was a question, I believe, that uh, he's referring to that Elu kind of expressed as well as far as generally being the voice of hesitance or restraint when it comes to taking these drastic actions, such as recalling the delegate. So I think that's one of the, one of the questions that people have. I mean, if we've waited this long uh, for things to kind of stabilize, he gets back from his trip in a couple of days. Why not wait till then? Why not just give him the benefit of the doubt there? I'm going to turn it over to you guys as far as answering that question. Um, okay, so Gronos has left us in the dark for three weeks, possibly, but he we, he showed um, activity issues when, in his term as a vice delegate. I had pointed this out to um, some people that he often didn't release the VD report on time, which not everyone paid attention to, to that, but I did. And I was really concerned that um, the vice delegate, one of the most important people in the region, is not always there. And I was pretty concerned about his activity. After a good start to the delegacy, he just... Um, he just disappeared. Maybe he went on his trip, or maybe he just, you know, relaxed. Maybe thought he done and he did enough, or. But, where's the guarantee that he will come back firing all cannons, um, and, um, just flip the switch and just be active again? This is a guy who, as is the is the delegate of. The biggest region in Asian states, in my opinion, is just not taking this job too seriously. I'm aware that he's on vacation, but the, even he's not doing the bare minimum, I feel like. So 
point is, what's the guarantee he'll continue to, you know, what's the guarantee that he will change this habit? Because I see this far more likely that, because this um, occurred to me as well, because I, th I see this far more likely, it's very hard to get out of bad habits from personal experience. It's, just, it's very hard to pick yourself up, and it's going to be very hard for him to get back to his activity levels as he did when he was acting delicate, for example. To not do your job properly for this long, I think actually needs to be taken. I think he tried to appeal to some of us at the end, and, you know, I think it was too little too late. That's just my personal opinion. I don't speak for the region, but I think he should be doing his job properly, and he hasn't been. And I took this action not just because I felt like it. I did. I thought this was the right thing to do to possibly wake him up. If he um, becomes active again, that's great. Okay, because that's what I want to see. A full, not a full time, I guess, an active delegate who cares about his region and his job. You know, that's what I want to see, and hopefully we'll see that. But now I'm not seeing that. As uh, somebody who's maybe not as close to the fire as the rest of us, I'm going to prompt you here, Ruben. What are you feeling on it? Well, it's obviously, like, understandable that his activity is uh, lower because he's on vacation, obviously. But it's also worth considering that uh, it's very strange that he goes to run for delegate um when he obviously, at least I assume, he planned this uh, vacation a, a couple months uh, before it happened. So I feel like he gravely underestimated um, the, or overestimated the amount of time he would have on his hands while on vacation, which I think is a big, was a big mistake on his part, but I'm personally not for recalling uh, a delegate at this time because I think it's a very drastic measure when in reality we haven't really seen what he can do, which is obviously the reason why people want to recall him, but I feel like just waiting a couple more days and just see how it goes and see if the vacation really ruined everything and uh, the vacation being over, uh, making him return to his normal activity uh, levels and being a good delegate again, um, hopefully uh, fixes things. But I don't know. I think it's very two-sided. I'm uh, still a little bit split on it, and I don't really have a clear uh, judgment on the situation. I think that's where everyone is. That's kind of valid. The uh, follow-up that Fiji's asking here in relation to this discussion is he says, Right, but if the problem is the trip, why not wait a week to see how the activity goes without the trip? And if the huge vacation was a problem, then the recall effort should have happened at the leave of absence point. If Garundi okay. returns from his trip and there's dead silence in the executive cabinet, then that would make more sense. Uh, I, again, I can only speak for myself about this, but uh, I'm... I'm fairly comfortable in saying that I've seen what I need to see from this. Uh, similar in the way that Chipoli has mentioned how Grandu sort of uh, appealed to them at the very final, you know, moments or days about, hey, how can I, you know, get you to not leave the too little, too late sentiment. There's nothing that I need to see from Grandu here as far as to, to change. Uh, it, it would be disingenuous of me to act like there was something that was going to change my mind on this. Because, he, as far as I'm concerned, he would never meet that requirement for me to switch viewpoints. So I'm not going to act like that. that's, you know, an attainable standard, because it's not. I've seen what I needed to see, uh, personally speaking. And generally, I get the sense that it's not about the trip. You know, we've been referencing the trip a lot, and of course it is a factor. But, like I mentioned earlier, as far as, like, enthusiasm, effort, the spirit of wanting to lead a region and taking it in a certain direction, I don't see any of those in him I, yeah I thanks, ha thanks ropes yeah i, I just it's have not, it it's not the trip yeah it's I, not it's not the trip like that's what i wanted to say when, when PG was kind of zeroing in on the trip thing like 
because people don't appreciate this because they haven't been in the cabinet and we have the the kind of concerns that we had existed before we went on the trip it's just that they weren't really really bad yet and it was still you know there was still a chance to work things out but communication's always been very difficult for this administration and the trip exacerbated it because it revealed some very strange things for example the fact that I felt Gurundu was actually more present while he was absent than when he wasn't. And the, the fact that someone else was calling the shots and advancing things, it's like Gurundu was very involved. He knew about all the decisions that were made. He was consulted on them, of course. But he started, I think, part of what went into his mindset was he was around so much during that period that he thought, well, I can probably just end the absence, you know, if I'm going to be around here this much. And to some degree, where there's like a little turf battle over, you know, having kind of having two delegates at the same time, and then, and if they disagree, well, pulling the plug on the absence is how you re ultimately resolve that disagreement. So I think that Gurundu saw that as part of his reasoning for coming back. And the thing is, it's not like he has not been around. He has. He's often been slow to respond at times, but you can talk to him. You can say all sorts of stuff to him. The problem is it's like there's a filter, and a lot of what you input does not come out, and the response you get is very restrictive, and it's, it's limited in scope, and it doesn't cover everything that you're trying to talk about. And it's been like that for almost a month. And trip or no trip... The problem is a lot of the ministers feel that that won't change even when he comes back. And putting things off for several days, like that's that's kind of the Gurundu style in a way. So if he comes back and says, okay, we're going to do this, and then a few days pass, the whole a few days pass, wait it and see, that's been, that's been how this delegacy has worked even before he went to Europe, really. And it's like, it's just enough to keep going, to give people a sense that there is forward motion, but it's not, it's not real. And when he finally realized just how fed up all the ministers were with it, it was kind of like a, like a blind side. Like he, he honestly didn't understand where it was coming from. And when you try to explain to someone all the things you're concerned with and why, and when you realize that they don't really understand, when they don't see what you're saying to them, that is more of a confidence killer than is the guy going to be online tomorrow and answer my question. It, it stops being about the specifics of what's going on, and it becomes more about, can I fundamentally be seen by this person? Does he actually understand what I'm saying, where I'm coming from? And as soon as that idea is gone, that you cannot connect, you cannot be understood by this person, then it's really hard if he comes back from the trip, let's see if anything changes. You're thinking, well, he might respond more often. He might post more. Sure, that's good. As far as the public's concerned, he's active. But as far as I'm concerned, as somebody who has to do a job for him, is it going? Is anything actually going to change? And Fiji's saying that sounds like relationship advice. And you know what? Uh, he's right. It does sound like relationship advice. When you're when you're working somewhere, you, there is a relationship involved with your employer, you know, employee employer, or in this case, minister and delegate. And um, if you're going to serve in the government, you have to be committed to that relationship. And if the commitment is broken, if if it's challenged this deeply, then you realize it doesn't really matter how around he is. Uh, it's it's not going to change. And then. You have to decide when you when you've reached your point when it's enough, and that's where these ministers were at. And even when he was responding, and there was a chance that maybe we can resolve this a different way, believe me, we had conversations. I talked to all of them. Everybody had reached their limit. They reached the point, and they decided they were going to keep pursuing it. They were going to keep going, and 
he, you know, he tried to communicate, he tried to work it out, and sometimes you can't. And we have to be okay with that. That's, we're all people. We're all human. So, um, you know, it's a game. We do this because it's a fun hobby and we enjoy it. And, but we also have to work as a team. And the team has to, has to stay together. The team has to believe in each other. And when that, when that doesn't happen anymore, then you just have to call it. That, that's what happened. It's, it was like a breakup. The breakup had to happen. You know, nobody was really, nobody wanted it to happen, but it, that's just the way it went. And that doesn't even mean Gurundu can't still be delegate. If he can, you know, earn the rest of his term with the region, then he can. And that's up to him. We, we helped him as much as we could, but we're not together anymore. So, you know, I'll give him, I'll give him a shot, but it's, it's a shot he's got to do on his own now. I'm not advising him anymore. That's this is the reality. I think uh, I think that's an excellent way of putting it, and I'm glad that you know we're able to get this more insight from the inside here on NBS. Uh, and and like you said, just being there. But do they see you? Like, do they understand you? Even if they respond to you, that's what I'm saying. As far as it not being about the trip, and I'm glad that we're able to kind of include that or be able to like offer that to our listeners, to kind of that perspective of why it's not necessarily about the trip. For those of us who really do ha- believe that this is sort of the limit that needs to be reached or what needs to be done, but um, I- I'm just going to say for my part, I-, I just think that the the idea that people came to him with these problems, these concerns, and the idea, not, uh, set aside the fact that the responses were delayed. I'm talking about when the responses were answered by him, irregardless of time, right? If you don't know what's the if people are telling you what the issue is and and you see that they're telling you what the issue is and you have that information available to you but you don't either a know what to do about it b work to figure out something to do about it or c actually like reciprocate that like un- acknowledge that concern and then you know find some workaround even with the limited time you have to me that either demonstrates one of two things and i think that's the core thing here just i don't know if it's a lack of awareness i don't know if it's just a lack of presence which of course might be tied to time but like like ghost has said he's been around it's just you don't like you can you can reach out but are you are you going to actually reach him that is that is the question and yeah, from where I said, I think it's just a lack of awareness. I think it's, I think he's just incapable at this point. Uh, people have brought that up as far as not even time-wise, but just ability-wise to meet these concerns, to to address this in a way that we would find satisfactory. I think at this point he's just incapable of that. And you know, people closer to the administration than I might be able to pinpoint when that was, but. F- like I said, from where I sit, and of course I can only speak for myself, I think it's just a lack of awareness, lack of ability to lead the region. Um, and that's Robes, why... Yeah. I would like to address uh, Fiji's latest comment. Sure, go ahead. Fiji's basically calling into question the idea of the cabinet leaving for resignation rather than just writing basically the same note, but without a resignation. And I will say, for me personally, that is unthinkable. Because the doctrine of cabinet solidarity, such as it is, it's not appropriate to sit in the government and basically say you have no confidence in it and then continue to do your job working for that delegate. I think that's unfair to the delegate and it's kind of disingenuous. If I have no confidence in that government, I need to resign from that government. I can't just have it both ways. So, yeah. We we all know that we're doing great work. We like what we're doing. We're good at our jobs. We want to keep doing them. But we're also the executive council. We're also working with the delegate. And if there's no confidence there, then I don't think the right thing to do is to take shots at him from behind the government's windows and then put him in a position where he has to continue to take our advice and... Uh, you utilize our talents while knowing that we don't trust him, we don't like him, whatever. And it's like, that that feels scummy to me. And, and I don't know, maybe that's just a me problem, but I feel like the other ministers agreed with that too. We kind of all understood if we were going to take this extraordinary step of speaking out of turn against the delegate, 
we can and this was in the resignation note it's not really something we can do as members of the government we have to be out of the government to throw the rocks at it basically and i think that's the professional way to handle it and if nothing else i i hope that we still have that in tmp that we can be somewhat professional about some of this stuff so uh i i certainly never would have considered writing that statement and still thinking that i could be an advisor to the delegate because a lot of the stuff in that statement i already was telling him in private not in front of the whole entire world and giving him a chance to respond to those things uh the other ministers same deal um and if that wasn't going anywhere then yeah, it was a it was a tough call, and that's what we decided to do. And I know more than a few people. I'm, I I I struggle to say it this way, but it's like when you're in the government, you're kind of in a box. There are certain things you cannot say or do because they're uh they would undermine the government, or you know, there's there's this element of protection that we're all engaging in, and some of us are still engaging in it because. There are things that you know you're privy to that you can't, you know, say, you know, bl bluntly out in the world, and that's just kind of how it works. And we didn't want to be tied up that way when we felt like there was a lot of stuff that had to be addressed and had to be confronted. So, um, and that was certainly, I think, more true for many of the ministers and myself. But to say everything that has to be said, uh, we can't do it while we're still there. So. I guess you and I have to dis agree to disagree on whether or not that's the best course of action. But uh, if I were the delegate and one of my ministers wrote a statement like that and didn't resign and still thought that he could be my minister, I <laughs> I would ask him to leave. That's what I would do. I would not I would not appreciate that. I I would I wouldn't appreciate him leaving in general, but I would appreciate it more than him thinking he can still have all of his powers and privileges and be part of the government while he's taking shots at it. So it's just my brain's just not wired to accept any other way to do to deal with it. That's just kind of how it is. And uh, I do want to take a crack at this question from Fiji, where he said, uh, "Do he asks, do you feel a broad resignation is more effective than a no confidence letter?" And my immediate answer to that is absolutely, it's more effective, and here's why. I think that the no confidence letter, had you had done that, um, the message would have been out there, which I think that the region does deserve to hear that message. As far as, you know, prior to this, it, I imagine it was largely kept internally, whereas now it's out in the open. I think that the region does deserve to know that members of the government have these grievances so that maybe members of the region don't necessarily feel alone in that, uh, in that sentiment. Um, but also, just the, the mass resignations force the delegate to address this. Like, regardless of if he issues a statement acknowledging, hey, here's the plan forward, like, he has to fill that. As I mentioned earlier, Minister of Foreign Affairs is a constitutionally mandated office. He has to take action on that. The no-confidence letter, um, in addition to the reason that Ghost mentioned about members staying, overstaying, whilst also criticizing the government, a no-confidence letter does not force him to act. Um, and as we've seen with this delegate, if you don't force him to act, he won't. Um, what, what a mass resignation does, and what this statement, I believe, in effect does, is it demonstrates exactly how if the delegate will, will not act, then other people will. And he is forced to respond to that um, as a result of this. Whereas if you had just simply issued a no-confidence letter without resigning your post, um, Ghost mentioned why, you know, that might be a bit... Uh, disingenuous on his part or you might feel a bit icky about doing that i just think it wouldn't work for the simple fact that a no confidence letter doesn't force him to act what is what is pre what is presenting a no confidence letter in front of the region different than how is it different than what they were saying to him in private and like ghost mentioned if he's heard that before and didn't do anything about it i don't necessarily think that there's anything out there to suggest that a no confidence letter in public would have necessarily forced him to act from what we've seen from him Whereas mass resignation obviously does because he has to fill those spots if he intends on continuing. It forces a response, and I think forced response is necessary in instances where the delegate uh, more or less refuses to do anything unless absolutely forced to. So yeah, that would be my answer to that. Um, unless there's anything else anybody wants to talk about, I saw Ruben come along online here, so unmuted, rather. So if 
you had anything? Yeah, I'd like uh, to echo that and this and basically say it in very uh, blunt uh, terms. Uh, resigning makes him do shit, and a no confidence letter does jack shit. So um, <laughs> that's basically uh, uh, how it is. But I do think this was a very uh, productive discussion, uh, assuming that it's going to come to an end. Uh, if not, we are near this- the end. Yeah, you know. Uh- I I do think that Chipotle wanted to say a few words before he heads off here. Okay, so let's think about this. If you had absolutely zero confidence in your delegate as the minister, if you had no confidence in the way he was doing things, would it be logical to stick around in something you have no confidence in? And for most of us, the answer would be no. And why stick around in something you don't believe in? I mean, that just doesn't make much sense to me. I don't know about it the rest of you, but that doesn't make much sense to me. And if we simply said we had no confidence, I'm not sure if our delegate would have acted as, I don't know, brashly, like decisively, or, you know, maybe made more steps to correct his delegacy or the region, as in just a no confidence, la- no confidence later, uh, compared to just the resignation letter we did end up proceeding with. It just forces him to replace ministers, and it wakes him up. It sort of serves as a wake-up call and, you know, forces him to act. Yeah, and I think the inverse criticism would have been true if in a a hypothetical sense they issued this letter of no confidence talking about how they don't believe that the, the delegate's leadership is suitable, then I can absolutely see someone responding, okay, then why are you guys still here? Like, I could totally see that being the reasonable response had they done what you're saying. So I think that the criticism could have just been inversed had you taken the resi- the uh, no confidence letter route as opposed to the mass resignation route, because what they're saying is if we have no confidence, there's no reason for us to stay. Well, had they, you know, did the opposite and issued the no confidence but said, oh, yeah, we're still going to stick around. I think people might have uh, found a bit of an inconsistency in that, or a bit of a, well, what's the word, uh, not, not contradiction, but uh, I, I'm missing the word at the moment, but I, I think that there would have been the inverse criticism, so I don't necessarily think that this was the incorrect way to go about that. I'm more I'm more partial to the side of Ghost's argument where he's talking about in Chipoli when they say that, you know, if we don't believe in it, there's no reason for us to stick around. If we can't do what we can do to the fullest ability because we're dragging a delegate behind us who doesn't, you know, absorb the information that we're telling him, then, yeah, there's no real reason for us to stick around. And it's unfortunate that it puts the region in this kind of spot, but if that's uh, if that's how we have to get a response out of this, then that speaks volumes because nothing like this has ever happened to a delegate um, in TNP or in any of the GCRs, to my knowledge. Um, so this is... A bit unprecedented territory as far as a cabinet just mass resigning in such a fashion. I do want to wrap things up here. Um, I, I want to thank everybody who has uh, kind of been a part of this discussion and put input to this discussion. But I, but I would be remiss if I didn't include at the beginning of the broadcast, I promised you guys an update on the court case, the North Pacific versus Magic, and I will deliver. Um, we're going to shift a bit from talking about this whole incidents to uh, just what ended up happening with the court case, because the last time we were on NBS, that's what we talked about. So, uh, the court rendered their decision, sentencing order. Uh, TLDR, the prosecution's sentencing recommendation was um, adhered to. It was accepted. Uh, Neither side, nor the defense, nor the prosecution had any rebuttals for one another. Uh, The charge was changed from espionage to gross misconduct, Um, And Magic was sentenced, effectively, to a suspension of voting rights for three months. So the Speaker's Office has taken note of when that suspension of voting rights will end. The punishment did not include a suspension of speech, um, but it does include the three-month ban for voting rights. And of course, there, there were a number of things that factored into that decision, which you can read in the court sentencing order. So yeah. I promised that I would include that in this episode, and of course I most absolutely will. Uh, If anyone has any more questions or remarks that they'd like to make, this would be the time. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and uh, sign off here.
Okay, well, um, I do remember that when the NBS uh, planning strategy was for this next show, uh, the idea was that it was going to go over the midterm update initially to include a midterm address from the delegate, but just to check in and see where everything was at at the midterm. Um, obviously, events have taken place that have kind of put that by the wayside, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, I know a lot of people talked about this earlier. Things have continued to move. Uh, we've had ministers doing a really good job. They've got a lot of projects they've been working on. Uh, it hasn't been totally silence and stuff hasn't been frozen in time so obviously we don't really have time to, to dive into all that stuff now and it's not really at the forefront of everyone's mind but i just want to say again this is you know my last remarks here we do have a great team they've been doing great work we're seeing a lot of progress the ministers who didn't resign in particular i'd like to highlight ha's been doing fantastic culture's been uh trying to get things back up and running and I think they've got some really intriguing things in the pipeline. Uh, the NPA has been out and about again. Very nice to see. Uh, so I I applaud the other ministers, and uh, I'm glad that they're still there keeping things going. Um, you know, it's a lot easier for me to resign and go away because all I do is talk and give advice. But ministers actually, you know, do stuff. So. I do want to, you know, once again, give them recognition for the really great work that they've been doing. And that, you know, kind of ties into that conversation we were having with Fiji where, you know, that they, they may not have confidence in Garundu or his performance as it is. But uh, the, the, the direction we were going in, the vision he had, uh, the stuff that the ministries are working on, absolutely. Uh, we all still have confidence in that, and, and we do recognize the good work that everyone was doing. So I'm sorry that this puts things in a really awkward position for Gurundu and the region, and it's uncomfortable, and we're still, once again, in that uncomfortable place that we've been in so often this year. 2023 has just been really great in that regard, but sometimes you got you just got to do these uh, these uncomfortable things and just have to roll through it. and. Uh, if he can get another team in place and he can get us to September at least, then good credit to him. If the region's satisfied, then they're satisfied. If they're not, well, we will know very soon. So uh, all I can say is sorry, but uh, had to be done. It is what it is. So uh, but I guess that's all I have to add. Yeah, I uh, obviously uh, commend all of the remaining ministers for all of their work and all of the former ministers as well for er all of the work they've put into uh, their respective ministries. I congratulate uh, the new Minister of World Assembly Affairs, uh, Mage Castle, and I wish all of the, uh, all of the new future appointees good luck. Uh, in this uh, hellfire, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I uh, think that's a good note to end off of. Good luck. That is that is what it is. Uh, will the audience get a shout out or something? This is your first time in a video. Sure, absolutely. Why not shout you out? A lot of you have uh, been here. We've had between uh, like seven to ten live audience members this entire time. Hey, thanks for sticking with us, guys. You know, I've seen a lot of people, of course, Fiji for asking questions. I know Sill's been here. I know Magic's been here. I know Attempted Socialism. Comfed's been here. Quiet Dad. We got everybody up in here. So, yeah, shout out to y'all, Kingdom of Time. Yeah, that's who asked the question. Give a shout out to them as well, because NBS with a live audience is a lot more fun than us just sitting here talking amongst ourselves. So thank you guys for Kingdom of that. Time. Endorse Kingdom of Time, please. <laughs> there you go. See, see, you got an S here vouching for your endorsement, so there you go. All right, well, uh, from everyone here, of course, Bob dipped a bit earlier, but uh, I know he's going to say this too. By the way, we did not see Magic here. I just want to clarify that. He I wasn't did. here. I did. I uh, he said he, guys. he said he wasn't here, so I have to take I have to take a word for it. Oh, okay. Well, we gotta believe him. But all right. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining us, and this is NBS signing off. Goodbye. What?